Buongiorno. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for, for the invitation to speak today at this wonderful conference, and I apologize that I cannot speak Italian. I promise to learn someday. I usually do not read my lecture notes, but since I have an interpreter today, it will be easier for her, so forgive me. I've entitled my talk today, Changing the Course of Autism. It is the same title as a book that I wrote about this subject. Autism, like cancer, is a modern medical crisis with rapidly rising numbers that have been poorly understood in the past and ineffectively treated. Because the rates of autism are now so high, it is critical that we change to what we are doing if we hope for a better outcome for our children. Okay. Before we talk about the future of autism, we need to understand the past. Autism was originally thought to be caused from poor parenting from mothers who do not express love of their children. This was known as the refrigerator mother theory and was popular until the middle of the 1960s. It was then recognized that autism had a biological rather than a psychogenic origin, but it was thought to be a genetic problem with its effects evident from very early in fetal development. It was considered very rare and not treatable. The diagnosis was made from behavior characteristics only and it became a disorder of psychiatry. I'm just going to go on. <laughs> Starting in the mid-1980s, something has happened. This is a graph from the state of California in the United States. They have kept track of autism numbers much longer than any other state. The rates in the 1970s were about 4 per 10,000 individuals, and the curve remained flat from year to year. This is what you would expect from a genetic illness. In the mid-1980s, the curve begins to rise until the mid-1997, mid when the rates have increased to over 30 per 10,000. When the rates of autism were compared to other developmental disabilities that they were tracking, there was a remarkable difference. Autism was rising, let's see. Autism was rising rapidly out of proportion to anything else, such as mental retardation, epilepsy, and cerebral palsy. This graph represents more recent numbers. The rates have continued to rise exponentially. In the 1970s, there were less than 300 individuals with autism in all of California. Now there are over 35,000. <clears> over 3,500 cases are being added every year. There are, there are 12 new children per day, seven days per week, that are being diagnosed. This is one new child every two hours. 80% of all individuals with autism in the state of California are between the ages of 3 and 18 years old. 
If it were a genetic illness, the rate should be the same across each age group, assuming that they were not dying early, which does not appear to be the case. This is not just a problem in California. The numbers were rising all over the United States. The Center of Disease Control started to doing controlled prevalence studies from eight-year-old children that's born in 1992 that were reported in 2000 and every two years later. They looked at all children with professionally diagnosed autism spectrum disorders in multiple states using the same case finding models in subsequent years. So even within a six-year period, from 2000 to 2006, the autism rates have continued to escalate. The most recent numbers from kids born in 1998 is one in 110 children overall, um, or one in 70 boys on average. The highest prevalence number from one state was one in 52 boys. This graph shows the difference between the 2002 data and the 2006 data. Here is 2002 in the dark blue, here is 2006. Um, these are done in the states that were used in both studies. You can see that every, every state has rising numbers. Arizona, which is here, oops, has almost doubled their autism prevalence in four years. To put this in perspective, I have graphed autism rate against other serious childhood illness, um, such as cancer, HIV, and diabetes in the United States, and autism dwarfs them all. Autism is not just a problem in the United States. The numbers are increasing almost all, in almost all developed nations that have reported prevalence numbers. One area in England has recently reported rates of 1 in 54 children. Traditionally, autism has been considered a purely genetic illness. This is based on a higher rate among identical twins compared to fraternal twins and a higher rate of autism in siblings compared to the general population. However, it is very uncommon to see autism in previous generations within the affected families.
there have been billions of dollars invested in looking for the autism gene. Unfortunately, the vast majority of studies have not found any significant consistent associated abnormality in the DNA structure. Only a few genes have shown a relevant association and they are found at very low rates in the autism population. So it is now clear that autism is not a simple genetic illness. So this, this red line is a line of significance and each dot represents a genetic study. And only two of the studies that have been done show significance. There is no such thing as a genetic epidemic. So if the rising numbers are real, it implicates the environment. Like most diseases, autism results from a combination of complex genetic susceptibility and environmental insults. In this slide, the gun represents the genetics and the bullet, the environment. You really need both to cause damage. There is an emerging field called epigenetics which I believe will help us to understand uh, this interaction better. This field focuses on how the gene expression is turned on or off by environmental factors. Under this model, inheritable changes can happen within one generation, and it does not require a mutation in the genome. I think that this will hold the key to uncovering the genetics of autism. It has traditionally been believed that autism is a neurological disorder. The latest research is showing that this is only partially true. In fact, autism is a metabolic disorder that affects multiple body systems. The neurological impairment is the most obvious, but when you get into more detail of their history, physical exam, and laboratory findings, we realize that almost all autistic children have impairments in several other organ systems. These include the gastrointestinal system, the detoxification system, the energy production system, and the immune system. So this is the detoxification, the energy production, and the immune system. The endocrine system may be involved as well. Doctors like to separate out body systems from the others and then specialize in one of these systems, hence cardiologists, neurologists, gastroenterologists, etc. Unfortunately, our bodies don't do that. Rather, all these systems are in a constant feedback with the others so that our body works as a unit. The above systems in particular are very tight, tightly connected with feedback loops. As an example, 70% of the immune system is housed in the GI tract. If your GI tract is damaged, so is your ability to fight infections. If your every neurotransmitter that is found in the central nervous system is also found in the GI system. So if you have abnormal neurotransmitters or receptors in the brain, it can affect how your bowels work. The main engine of the toxicology system is the liver, which is considered part of the GI system, and it requires the immune system to help recognize the toxin. 
If toxins are not processed appropriately, it affects how the brain works, and so on. The biomedical approach to treatment attempts to understand the underlying mechanism of illness in autism at a biochemical level and correct if, if possible, rather than just controlling behaviors with strong and potentially dangerous psychotropic medications. The slides get shorter after this. Many doctors have the assumption that there is little research that backs up this model. In fact, that is not true. There is a great deal of biological research that now show these, shows these interactions in autism. In fact, there are hundreds of papers. If you would like the references specifically, I will give you a link at the end of the talk. I just want to give you a basic overview about what the research is showing. First, many studies have now documented that there is a link to the gut in autism. They have shown a patchy, chronic, and acute inflammatory pattern in the bowels of children with autism to varying degrees. Often it is quite severe. There is strong evidence of immune dysregulation, including abnormal levels of a variety of immune cells and cytokines. There is also a higher frequency of infection in young children who develop autism and a higher rate of antibiotic use. Many studies have shown a pro-inflammatory profile in both the GI tract and, the, and in the blood. 
Many children with autism also have abnormal local and systemic immune responses to food, most commonly gluten, casein, and soy. Many children with autism have high levels of abnormal bowel bacteria and yeast species. These organisms can produce metabolites that affect behavior. Chemical byproducts or incompletely digested food proteins can also affect behavior. A chronic inflammatory process has now been definitively documented in the brain of individuals with autism. This is primarily a persistent activation of microglial cells in the innate immune system, which can cause injury to surrounding cells and tissues. This is most evident in the cerebellum. Autistic children have an impairment in their methylation cycle, which can lead to abnormal control of their neurotransmitter function, oxidative stress, low glutathione levels, and impaired detoxification. This poor detoxification capacity results in cellular injury from environmental insults, even in exposures that would not cause harm to most people. The developing brain is extremely sensitive to injury from oxidative stress and environmental toxicity. Immunoexcitotoxicity results in cellular injury from excess glutamate and impaired calcium signaling. Mitochondrial dysfunction is common in autism. It is found in up to 65% in some studies. There are also problems with fatty acid metabolism, citric acid cycle function, and cofactor deficiencies. These, this leads to impaired cell function and more damage from oxidative stress.
So we have many problems in many organ systems. I'm not going to read through these, but um, it, as clinicians and researchers, we must recognize that all of these problems are working together. And in, in um, sorting them out in an individual child is, can be very challenging. So what can be done? Is autism treatable? This is hard. <laughs> It's building up the suspense. Okay, because it is so complicated, I tried to break down the treatment options in order of priority, realizing that there is a lot of crossing the lines between each system. I focus initially um, and most heavily on correcting the underlying nutritional biochemistry and altering the diet to prevent food sensitivity and further nutritional deficiency. Then I focus on addressing the various issues in the gut in the GI system. Next is supporting the detoxification system and correcting oxidative stress. Then I use various modalities to modulate the immune response. Finally, I use supplements or medications that target brain chemistry more directly. Notice the difference between this approach to autism and what the vast majority of doctors do to treat these children. The treatment pyramid for most doctors in mainstream medicine treating autism is entirely yellow. All they do is put children on antipsychotic medications and hope that it improves their behaviors. This approach is missing all of the foundation of adequate treatment and not surprisingly does not result in very favorable outcomes in the vast majority of, of patients.
I keep trying to shorten my talk, but he won't let me. <clears throat> okay. Unfortunately, I will not have time to go into very many details of treatment, but here is an overview. First, ensure that the children are eating a nutritionally healthy diet of organic food. When using, supplementation, when using supplementation to the diet, it is important to ensure that you are using high quality products, relative high dosing for water soluble vitamins like, vitamin, or like B vitamins. Some caution with fat soluble vitamins, such as vitamin A. I suggest that parents introduce supplements one at a time to look for obvious good or bad reactions and to start low and work up to effective doses. These are the common nutrients that I include in my treatment. A good multivitamin with higher doses of B vitamins, especially to overcome production, energy production abnormalities. Minerals, especially zinc, magnesium, calcium, and selenium. I avoid copper since most kids with autism have higher than normal copper levels to begin with. I use cod liver oil as a source of vitamin A. I give additional vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids. And many children also receive carnitine and coenzyme Q10 for mitochondrial support. There are many autism diets that are being tried. What is the right diet for an autistic child? The answer is that it depends on the patient. And how do you figure that out? You do elimination challenges and see how they respond. You can use tests to help guide you, but they are not always accurate. The best test is clinical response. I start with gluten, casein, and usually soy removal. Other common food offenders include eggs, corn, nuts, potatoes, and phenol-containing fruits. There are other more advanced diets in autism but that may work best for individual children. Almost done.
When evaluating GI symptoms, gastrointestinal symptoms, I asked several questions. Are there food sensitivities? If so, you eliminate the foods that are causing them. Is there malabsorption or maldigestion? If so, make diet changes or try digestive enzymes. Are there pathogenic gut organisms? If so, treat them with antifungals, antibiotics, or probiotics, et cetera. Is there a motility issue or constipation? If so, treat it with fiber, magnesium citrate, extra vitamin C, et cetera. Is it an inflammatory bowel disease? If this is suspected, it is best to get an endoscopy to look at the severity and the pattern and treat with anti-inflammatory agents. I support the detoxifica detoxification pathway with folinic acid, methyl B12, magnesium sulfate, taurine, glutathione, or N-acetylcysteine. In children who test high for heavy metals, I chelate them. I support the immune system with nutrients like vitamin A and zinc. I remove allergens and treat allergies with various modalities. I use immunomodulators, both prescription and non-prescription, to address inflammation, autoimmune issues, and immune deficiencies. Other therapies that can help include antivirals, hyperbaric oxygen, and treating strep bacteria. Treating the brain involves clearing out abnormal food sources and bowel bacteria that can create false neurotransmitters. Treat inflammation, as mentioned on previous slides. Treat seizures when present. Many supplements have neuromodulatory effects like 5-HTP, GABA, and melatonin. I reserve psychoactive prescriptions to the end for unresolved issues. I have found that the vast majority of children with autism do not need these medications. Aggressive behavior management is also very important. Applied behavioral analysis, or ABA, is best studied and most accepted, although there are other programs that work very well for some children. The most important thing is intensive and individualized care. Education intervention works with medical intervention, not as a substitute for it, and vice versa. Just a few more slides, we're almost done.
So if we're going to change our, if we are going to change the course of autism, we need to change our thinking about autism. Autism is clearly no longer rare. It is not just a genetic problem. It is not just a developmental or, or, a psychi or a psychiatric disorder. And it is not static. Treatment can make a difference. So the future of autism is removing the diagnosis from the psychiatric manual and recognizing that it is a multi-organ system disease. The future of autism will keep kids out of institutions and put them in doctor's offices who are partnering with the parents to help these individuals reach their maximum potential of health and functionality. Many of these children have the capacity of dropping the autism diagnosis and leading a functional and productive life. I wrote this book called Changing the Course of Autism to help mainstream doctors recognize that they need to change their view about how to treat this disease. Many doctors are now starting to recognize these issues and are changing their practices. For those of you who would like to look in more detail at the research that I presented here, there's a large bibliography on our website at www.thoughtfulhouse.org. Once again, I thank you for your invitation um, to letting me speak in your beautiful country. I apologize that it took so long to get through my lecture, but um, I appreciate the opportunity, and I wish you well in helping these beautiful children. Thank you. Scusate, vorrei fare una domanda. <laughs> Grazie per la relazione. Eh, io ho avuto la fortuna di conoscere il professor Thomas Talberg, immunologo dell'Università di Helsinki, e leggere alcuni lavori relativi all'esiopatogenesi dell'autismo. Eh, eh, lui asserisce questo, che una delle cause che può determinare la malattia può essere dovuta a un deficit nella dieta della mamma durante la gestazione, con un basso apporto di, soprattutto di grassi, fat, nella dieta. Vorrei sapere la sua esperienza, se ci sono ricerche nel Texas su questo argomento. Della, nella dieta, deficit di a parte della madre, nella dieta della madre. Um, I, I think that there is some... Early research coming out, especially, I know that there's an interest in vitamin D deficiency in, in the mothers that are affecting the, their offspring. But I think that it's very possible and very likely that the effects that we're seeing in the autism generation is from the, the generation of the mothers. And whether it's toxins or nutrient deficiencies or, um, you know, exactly what, i don't know, but, but I think you're right. I think that that's possible. Ci sono degli studi a riguardo, credo, della vitamina D3, nel deficit di vitamina D3 nelle madri, che determinano, possono creare problematiche neurologiche nei bambini. Sicuramente ci sono delle implicazioni nelle sostanze tossiche eh, che, la ha, uh, uh, che la madre ha e passa per via placentare uh, nei bambini. Però sicuramente c'è una connessione e noi lo crediamo fermamente che ci sia questa connessione. La connessione sembra che sia dovuta alla particolare restrizione dietetica durante la gravidanza della mam della mamma con, per 
con conseguenza e come conseguenza l'aumento dell'incidenza di questa malattia che spiega l'aumento. Non crede che solo questo possa giustificare l'aumento dell'autismo. Sicuramente c'è stato un profondo cambiamento nelle abitudini dietetiche negli ultimi due o tre decenni che possa essere implicato nella causa, ma ci sono altre cause che, come ha descritto, legate a questa cosa. Grazie. Grazie.